serious, it's fun, it's your Catholic drive time. With Joe McLean and Emily Alcaraz. Good morning, sir. It's a great joy to be here with you. Praise be to God. Gabby, After Hours YouTube channel, True Faith Talk TV, there's a ton of stuff. We've, we love having you on. Uh, the Seven Sorrows of Mary and Preparing for Holy Week. Are you ready for Holy Week? No, I'm not ready, and I don't think I'll ever be as ready as I should be, especially when I'm yeah. looking at Our Lady in light of all of this. Yeah, for sure. So we thought it'd be great to do one last opportunity to help us get ourselves prepared for the biggest and greatest feast day in our calendar. What? Tell us about the Seven Sorrows of Mary. What is the Seven Sorrows of Mary? I know there's big promises that come with yes. it. Tell us all about it. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm very fond of saying that, and many saints are, and many people say this, the quickest, shortest, easiest, best, most efficient, most secure way to Jesus Christ is through Mary. And the heart of all of that is the heart of the Virgin Mary. So Mary loved Jesus perfectly because she was immaculate, because she got all these graces and preparations from God for her soul. And so she loved Jesus perfectly from a natural perspective because that was her son. So because that's her son, she automatically loves him more than any other person who's ever lived. But then at the same time, that's her God. And God had prepared her that somebody on this earth would appreciate Jesus Christ perfectly. Mm. We don't appreciate his sufferings the way we should because our hearts are are constantly self-seeking, full of self-love. And so Our Lady's soul truly does magnify the Lord. If you want to get at the heart of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, what he did for us throughout his passion, the best way to look at him is with the eyes and the heart of the Virgin Mary. And the saints are unanimous. A lot of the things I'm going to say might sound a little bit uh, extreme, but I can assure you they're all said by the saints, saints such as St. Bernard, St. Bernadine, St. Anselm, St. Alphonsus Liguari, St. Bridget. So I'm getting a lot of this information from the wonderful book, The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus. And throughout it, sorrow after sorrow, he keeps reemphasizing that all of the saints say that it was a grace from God that the Virgin Mary did not die from sorrow. Mm. That if you were to take the sorrow that the Virgin Mary experienced just throughout her entire life, Mm -hmm. and you spread it up out upon every man that's ever lived, every single one of them combined would have died instantaneously from the sorrow. A lot of times we think of the Virgin Mary as having this perfect life. God appeared to her. She gets to have the Savior of the world, but her entire life was marked by sorrow. Oh, that's a great point. I think a lot of us Catholics, they'll say, yeah, 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 gay, but, you know, she was perfect. I'm not perfect. And they even, I've even heard Catholics say that about Jesus, too, as if because they were perfect, they were incapable of sinning. And I always say, well, no, they had the ability to sin. They were as tempted. They chose not to, yeah. unlike you and me. Yeah. And, and we also forget that Christ chose suffering because that is something that we all have. And so it's fitting that the model of Christians would be the model of suffering, which is Our Lady. And St. John of the Cross often said that suffering endears men to Christ. So if suffering is what's going to make us love Christ and turn to him more, Our Lady, who is perfect, had to suffer perfectly. Mm. So she has a heart that if we could only enter into it. So a lot of times we pick up a lot of devotions and a lot of activities that we can be doing, and sometimes they distract us from really what's at at hand, what's at the core of the gospel, what's at the heart of the gospel, Mm -hmm. and we see that most perfectly through the heart of the Virgin Mary. And so there's a devotion to the seven sorrows, and why the number seven? Did she suffer more than seven times? Yes, she suffered thousands of times, and she they say that she suffers still today. But the number seven specifically, because that's a perfect number, to kind of represent that Our Lady suffered perfectly. And her first sword in her heart, so to speak, was the one that the uh, prophet Simeon prophesied, that a sword will pierce your heart, that your son will be a stumbling block for many. Our Lady already knew or had the idea that her son was going to be, you know, crucified, that he was going to die, because she was wiser than all of the prophets. She had a great understanding of sacred scripture. She was illumined by the Holy Spirit. And so although she already knew this, when the prophet Simeon proclaimed this, in in a mystical way, it was like already now that sword is jabbed in her heart, and everything that she saw, everything that her son did, taking his first steps, hearing his first words, 
everything that she experienced that normally would be moments of joy mm. were from this point on tinged with sorrow. It's kind of like if a, if a parent knew all of the sufferings that their child was going to experience, like, thank God we don't know the things that our kids are going to go through throughout their lives because we wouldn't be able to sleep at night thinking about these, these trials and sufferings. Mm. But Our Lady was graced and at the same time w- was burdened with this knowledge of the depth of the sorrow of her son. And every time she looked at his face, whenever she wiped a tear away, whenever she wiped sweat off his brow, she was also contemplating the suffering that he was going to experience. The second sorrow of Our Lady, and this is, and I'm going to give you some tips on how to remember these. So the first sorrow is that one sword that Simeon prophesied that a sword will pierce your heart. The thoughts of many might be revealed. The second sorrow, I think of it as kind of a double sorrow, is that the flight into Egypt and then the massacring of the innocent. So I I tie the two together as a way to remember that there's two. Mm. So the idea that the savior of the world who come who came to save humanity was already going to be rejected by humanity as an infant just freshly out of the womb and they're already trying to kill him and not only that that he came to save the jews and he's being run out of his home country to go to instead of being in, being able to go to the temple and be, go to the synagogue he's being run off to egypt so he can be in the presence of demons and all their false gods he had to travel by foot our lady's probably only 15 years old traveling across the desert in ways and paths that aren't well worn that don't have hotels that she's taking this arduous journey throughout the night all because the love of her son is being rejected from such a young age he didn't come to steal anybody's throne he didn't come to harm anybody Mm. he came to love and already he's being rejected and so the heart of a mother that's already seeing that her son's only mission in life is being rejected by men the sorrow is unimaginable but at the very least she still had him in her, in her arms. She had the consolation, like we go through suffering, but we have the consolation and the peace of soul of having Jesus with us. The third sorrow of Our Lady is extremely tragic. Again, this is where many of the saints would say that if we could experience the depths of her sorrow in this third sorrow, we would die. Yes. Uh, Gabriel Castillo is back on our program today talking about the seven sorrows of Mary and, uh, and how this can help us prepare for Holy Week. Gabriel, uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. So we were last talking about the third sorrow of the Virgin Mary, and that is easy to remember because if you pray the sorrowful mysteries, that's the, no, I'm sorry. If you pray the joyful mysteries, this is, no, I don't, I don't remember. The third sorrowful mystery, the third sorrow of Our Lady. Sorry, I had a brain yeah. fart. The, <laughs> the way to remember it is that Jesus was lost for three days. Yeah. And parents can kind of have some idea of what she experienced mm-hmm. because you can imagine the anxiety and the fear and the desperation if you lost your child mm-hmm. and you lost him for three days. But more so for Our Lady, she had this sense that maybe she wasn't worthy. Like, th- I failed God. I-, I was entrusted with the Savior of the world. So not only did she lose her son, yeah. but she, in a way, kind of sensed that she lost her mission to lose the Savior of the world. Did she, did she ruin God's plan? Was she not worthy to carry forth God's plan? And in a way, this gives all of us hope because she had an idea that she was gonna going to get him back. But we, too, can find our Lord in the temple, in, in our souls, when we when we seek God earnestly. We should have you back and just, just talk about that one point. I could spend literally hours discussing that one point, um, but we can't we don't have time for that right now. So keep going. And then so the fourth the fourth sorrow is easy to remember because it's the fourth sorrow when you're praying the sorrowful mysteries. And mm-hmm. that is Jesus carrying of the cross. Now you have to imagine that our lady had not seen her son getting scourged at the pillar. She's seeing him for the first time after his passion has begun. Yeah. So she can barely recognize him. Mm-hmm. Imagine she sees Jesus fine at the Last Supper. They take him off. And now on the way of the cross, he looks like a leper covered from head to toe in sores, mm-hmm. a crown of thorns. People are mocking him. People are beating him. And then if you want to meditate upon what, how her heart must have sunk into her stomach when she saw her Savior, her son, whom she put diapers on, now being ridiculed and bandied about throughout the streets. And then the sorrow that she saw in his eyes to see his own mother suffering so greatly at at what is happening to him so all of this sorrow tinged with a sense of fulfillment like this is what he came to do mm-hmm. so it, it's a weird combination of emotions that our lady must be experiencing you know one of the points i like to point out about our lady is uh she experienced all of the anxiety the fear all of the temptations but unlike me who with my concupiscent nature 
um, born in sin, uh, I she didn't react to those same things the way I would react. She mm-hmm. reacted in a way uh, far with far greater virtue and holy sanctity than I tend to. When like if I blow a flat tire, I immediately begin to worry about how am I going to afford this new flat tire. You know, you see what I'm saying? It's yes. like I think it's a point that we should emphasize about Our Lady. It's not as though she didn't experience all of these uh, terrible emotions and temptations. It's that she didn't give herself into despair. She always accepted God's will for whatever it was. And that's what's so beautiful about this devotion is because you're looking, you're, you're finally being able to look at all of these actions with the purest of hearts. Mm. And, and it really is like, wow, if my, if my intentions were clear and I wasn't, you know, looking for my own self-interest, this is what I would be seeing. And the fifth sorrow of the Virgin Mary is the fifth mystery in the Most Holy Rosary, which is the crucifixion and death of our Lord. And the saints say that Our Lady stood there dying, yet she wasn't allowed to die. Yeah. She everything that happened to Jesus Christ physically, she was experiencing in an excruciating way in her heart. And this is really where it, it, it is finished. That the sword, Fulton Sheen, I believe, says that on that day, two hearts were pierced with a single lance. Mm. And so you can imagine the sorrow. There's no human words that can express because we can't see it perfectly, but seeing the savior of the world lifted up being mocked, ridiculed, still rejected. So few people who have even an appre- all of his apostles are gone. His entire life's work looks like it's wasted. There's only one apostle there. And the mother who stood by the cross. A lot of times I don't like looking at religious art that shows Our Lady, you know, fainting or on the ground. Our Lady stood by the cross because yeah. she, she had a sense of her own mission to be there for her son. And some of the saints say that Our Lord had such a great sorrow having to look down at his mother suffering so much because we forget. So we go to the Virgin Mary because she's the perfect daughter of God the Father, because she's this perfect spouse of the Holy Spirit, because she's the perfect mother to Jesus Christ. And so they loved her absolutely perfectly. Mm. The sixth sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary is having having him taken down from the cross and laid in her arms. And you can only imagine the shock that he, when you see a dead body for the first time, it's kind of shocking. It's very disorienting mm-hmm. because they're no longer there. And so here for the first time in human history, in the only time in human history, you have the body of Christ without the real presence. So Our Lady is holding her son, but he's not there anymore. And so she's clinging to him and she's clutching him. And all these memories are going, going on in her mind. And just the utter, I, I like to contemplate the utter shock of holding the body of Christ with no Christ inside. Mm. The, the seventh sorrow of the Virgin Mary is putting him in the tomb. Now, you can, if you've been to a funeral, you know that sense when the body is lowered into the ground and they put the dirt on top of it, and you're like, this is it, it's done. There's no more. And so Our Lady had a similar experience where the, the stone is being rolled back, and she envies the stone because at least the stone can keep watch over, over his body. Wow. But she, she knows in her heart because her son filled her in on the whole story. So it's a, a sadness, it's a sorrow that she will experience, that she will meditate on for the rest of her life. Mm-hmm. Every activity the saints say, for the rest of her life, she's going to be contemplating this because our Lord deserves somebody to be meditating upon his passion day and night in every aspect of his life. But at the same time, she knows that all of this suffering was not wasted, that it was for the salvation of our souls. And there's a story of a Jesuit in the, or it, that the Jesuits tell in the glories of Mary, where a young man who every day would go and look at an image of the seven sorrows of Our Lady. And one night he was going to go and commit a mortal sin, and he actually committed a mortal sin. And the next day he looked at the image of the seven sorrows, and what happened? She had an eighth sword through her heart. Oof. And she said, you did this to me when you Ouch. sinned, when you turned against me. Ouch. So there's a couple of ways to have this devotion. There's not one way to do this right. So the easiest way is to simply pray seven Hail Marys, one in honor of each of the seven sorrows of Mary. If you want your seven Hail Marys, if you want your Hail Marys to go a long way, just think for a moment upon each one of these seven sorrows. Yeah, you'll have to have a card or a little note to remind you of what these sorrows are at first, but this is an efficient way, only three minutes to really shoot an arrow towards heaven. Because yes, God loves when we go to our mother and she'll intercede for us, but how much more is he gonna love that you're consoling her heart, 
keeping her company at the foot of the cross, keeping her company in all these sorrowful moments. The, another way to have this devotion is by praying the Seven Sorrows Rosary, also known as the Servite Rosary. Long story short, it's the same thing, except you take rosary beads, or you could use your fingers, or you could make whatever device you want, and you're praying seven Hail Marys at each of the seven sorrows, when Our Father and seven Hail Marys at each of the seven sorrows. I like that devotion. There's a lot of benefits to this. So one of the benefits is you'll be enlightened about the divine mysteries. Why? Because you're meditating upon sacred scripture, because you're meditating upon the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you're meditating upon the suffering of Our Lady, all of the things that God the Father looks upon with the most favor and the most love. So by meditating upon these things, the Holy Spirit is going to enlighten your mind. Also, this is extraordinarily catechetical. If you have young children, praying seven Hail Marys with them is reasonable, mm. and it goes through the, the most important aspects of the life of Jesus Christ. So very powerful devotion. It's powerful in supplication for the reasons I just mentioned. You're asking our Lord for something. There's nothing greater than you can, that you could offer him is the passion of Jesus Christ, also in light of the most pure love of Our Lady. If you're suffering from diabolical attacks, if you're suffering from temptations towards lust, if you're suffering from temptations towards drug addiction, there is nothing that the devil hates more than the blood of Jesus Christ and the tears of the Virgin Mary. Mm. Meditate upon her sorrows. Meditate upon his passion. The two of them together, the, the, this is what conquered hell and death. So this devotion, very, very powerful. Also, I find that it offers me the grace of conversion and repentance. Sometimes I'll be lax in praying my rosaries, but when I'm meditating upon the seven sorrows, I find myself naturally forcing myself to be reverent when I don't want to be, because this is such a sensitive topic for the Virgin Mary. If I'm not on my knees, I get on my knees just because of the sense of guilt. How can I think of something so intrinsically hard for the Virgin Mary's heart, the, the sorrow, the heart, the heart of Mary is intrinsic to sorrow. It is wounded permanently and it is wounded eternally. How could I not get up, get on my knees and, and just kind of have a sense of sorrow alongside Our Lady? So in short, this provides intimacy with the Virgin Mary. And, and there's a, an apparition that happened in Africa, which we recognize as a Rwandan genocide. Most mm -hmm. people have heard of the Rwandan genocide. Well, Our Lady appeared in 1981 to some young people and warned them that if they did not repent of their sins, and especially by praying the, so the Servite Rosary, the Rosary of Our Lady of Sorrows, that a great evil was going to happen. And she gave all these people a vision of a river that was covered in blood and that there was dead bodies and that there was war and there was chaos. And they obviously did not you know, conform to Our Lady's warning. And so we have this massive tragedy that happened in Africa that many people um, will never forget, and it's never going to be erased from the minds of people. But they go hand in hand with the warning of Our Lady. Fatima didn't. Yes. Isn't that what Our Lady of Fatima told the children? Yep. You know, instead of uh, tanks, planes, and nuclear bombs, get on your knees and pray. Do acts of reparation and mortifications and penance. Uh, it's the secret weapon. Uh, yes. You know, in the spiritual world and in the material world is uh, prayer, fasting and penance. And this week we have an opportunity. Yes. Uh, Gabriel Castillo, thanks for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Praise be to God. The challenge to uh, pray the seven sorrows uh, of Our Lady this week. Maybe we can all do that. Uh, it, it's a big challenge, but maybe we can step up and do the seven sorrow challenge this week. I yes. wonder who's in. Are you in? If you're hanging out with us on live video, comment hashtag seven sorrow challenge and let us know you're going to be in on that. I know uh, we're going to be uh, taking up the task. G Gabriel Castile, we'd love to have you back soon. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a great day. You God too. bless you. That's going to do it for our number one of Catholic Drive Time. Praise be to God. Our number two is fast approaching. Coming up in only just a few minutes from now, we would love to have you. Our game show is back on the agenda, plus the after show, breaking news and stories, and so much more still headed your way. And if you can join us, great. If you can't, we'll see you back here 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. If you need the links, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. God love you. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.